Don't shoot the messenger. This week we'll be discussing why every online company is scrambling to create the next big private peer-to-peer -peer messaging service. We'll also be reviewing our invite-only beta test of the new Google Inbox app. And as requested by one of our listeners who wrote in to us last week, we'll be teaching you the difference between a computer program and an app. Hello, I'm Cameron. And I'm Luke. We're here from Free Deal Studio, keeping you up to date with the latest app news and releases. This is App To Date. Help support your favourite podcasters while we try and fix the internet. Thanks a lot, Kim Kardashian. To donate, make sure you head over to patreon.com forward slash app news and we shall be eternally grateful. So, what is an app? Not WhatsApp, but what is an app? <laughs> a very good question. So one of our listeners wrote in and asked us, what actually is an app? What actually is the difference between an app and a computer program? Well, well, well. <laughs> There's been an ongoing discussion in the tech community regarding what exactly an app is and whether or not it is any different to a traditional computer program. And well, today we think we have the answer. The word app is short for application, as many of you will know. And in this case, it refers to a software application. In other words, a software program. But an app isn't just any old software program. It's a special type of software program. App typically refers to software used on a smartphone or mobile device, such as the iPhone or iPad, as in mobile app or iPhone app. And while undeniably the line between apps and programs has become increasingly blurred, a general distinction can be made between the two when you look at what they actually do. Generally speaking, a software program, such as Microsoft Word, can perform a range of functions for the user, including exporting and importing various file formats. But a mobile app, however, which can be classed as a subset of programs, is a specialised software designed for a specific task on a specific set of devices. So essentially, we started with software application, which led to the creation of mobile applications, which shortened to mobile apps, which was further shortened down to just apps. And then everyone got it confused. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, essentially, essentially. It's, it's quite an interesting evolution, actually. See, one of the ways you defined it to me earlier, because we were, we were kicking about our own ideas of what an app is compared to a software, is that maybe the way to say it would be that an app doesn't have a native file format. You can open a file on a program. So you can open a JPEG on Image Viewer, uh, you can open a word, dot word or whatever on a Word document, but you can't open a file straight into an app. Yeah. But then that gets blurred when you start looking at files such as uh, on Dropbox. Exactly. Uh, so it does get it gets a bit of a hazy line there, to be honest. But I would say the general rule is if it doesn't have its own native file format, it's not a software. Yeah, it's an, it's app. an app. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that as technology or mobile technology improves and increases everything's just going to be a software program or everything's going to be an app because it's, it's certainly it I certainly think, seems to be the direction i think the thing to bear in mind is every technological phrase with the exclusion of most of the physics side of computing is made up for computing so it is what we make it yeah absolutely it's jargon, jargon busters here. We should do a jargon busters feature, actually. Oh, don't tell them what we're doing oh, oh, next. Oh, no, oh. <laughs> don't tune in next week. <laughs> and moving on from our eloquent explanation. Of what an app is. Uh, our favourite antagonist, uh, long-term enemy of the show, Snapchat, finally began warning users about using third-party application. Well done, Snapchat. You're right on time with that one, aren't you? <laughs> Following the massive loss of a huge number of private messages, images, details and marbles of Snapchat users last month, Snapchat have finally began to warn users about the dangers of using third-party applications. The notifications will prompt users to change their password and warn them about the danger. Tough talk in the latest articles claiming that Snapchat may permanently lock accounts using third-party applications. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure I could get... I'm sure I could get a new account with Snapchat if I really wanted to use Snapchat, so it's not too much of a big deal if you get locked out. Um, as long as I don't still receive the notifications, because I can't think of a worse hell than that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but what about my personal details? Like, when, when I sign up and they lock me, does that not... They don't delete your account. 
That means they're going to be keeping your personal information and you can't do anything about it. Forever and, and ever. ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Forever more. Uh, I, hope, I hope that's not the case. I hope they actually delete your account, not just lock it, as they claim to say. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of an interesting little point, actually. I mean, this also goes back to what we said in the previous podcast about Snapchat. Is this is really not a solution. This is not even a quick fix. This is just simply not good enough because the number of jailbroken iPhones out there that will be using third-party apps, regardless of whether Snapchat make these changes or not, means that everybody in the Snapchat network is at risk of being exposed to third-party applications anyway. If you send a Snapchat to somebody who's on a jailbroken iPhone using third-party apps, there's nothing you can do about that. So it, it, it's pointless, it's essentially pointless. The best way to do it would be to, if you were sending to somebody who uses third-party applications, to be alerted that they use third-party applications. Exactly. That's the best way to do it. But for some reason, Snapchat are just so flippant with the Data Protection Act, I think they're using it as a coffee coaster. <laughs> Personally, I really don't see this as much of a development. And Snapchat, sort it out. It's getting embarrassing. It's getting embarrassing. It, you know, even we know the vulnerabilities here. Maybe we should it's run stupid. an experiment to see how far we can go into hacking Snapchat before they even notice. But then we can get in a lot of trouble with their legal team, so let's not do that. Hey guys. So in the six hours since we recorded this podcast, a major breakthrough has come through about Snapchat and we just couldn't let it slide. Uh, we'll be discussing it next week, but quickly for now, here's the breaking news headline. Snap Cash has been announced. It's official. Snap Cash. And while Snapchat doesn't ask for your real name, it will certainly be on the debit card you use for its new peer-to-peer -peer payments feature announced just now. This could prove very lucrative for the company as it ramps up its monetization efforts. Although some websites have reported that users connect their debit card to their Snapchat accounts, Snapchat won't actually access any of your financial information. As anyone who signs up for the service will essentially be creating a Snapchat themed Square Cash account, so your financial information should be in safe hands. The interesting thing is that the real names, addresses and account information associated with those debit cards could potentially be cross-referenced with databases of personal information to give Snapchat a much better idea of who users are and what ads they might want to see. And Square Cash's terms of service do permit third-party advertising and analytics with illegalese that likely grants it the freedom to cooperate with Snapchat for ad targeting. Next up, just a quick thumbs up. Now we've gone past that negative point. Quick thumbs up to some really cool things that have caught our eye. Your second favourite web browser has now turned a decade old. They're celebrating their 10th year by adding a new feature. I'm, of course, talking about Mozilla Firefox and uh, their new forget button, which brings quick and easy access, uh, one click in order to delete a set period of internet history, cookies and browser data, which is pretty cool. So thumbs up for that. Absolutely. Instagram have finally released an update to the application which allows you to edit locations and captions without re-uploading your photographs. Uh, so that's another thumbs up from us. Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of people have complained about that. And I myself, you know, you make the occasional typo when you're uploading something on Instagram and it's, you've got to delete it. Grammar Nazis catch you. They do, they catch you, that's mm -hmm. it. And they are completely merciless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, BlackBerry released BBM Meetings, which allows you to conference call up to 25 users at once, which is absolutely amazing for a mobile application. Highly recommend it. But it's not featuring in our main stories because it is quite expensive in terms of the subscription. Any figures on that subscription? Uh, it, it, roughly £10 a month. Ten roughly £10 a month. month. But you yeah. have to pay it annually, so that's twelve uh, £120, which is however many dollars, $200? We'll edit this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just say every version of how much it might cost. <laughs> Following last week's story regarding Mark Zuckerberg's Q&A in which he tried to justify the standalone Facebook Messenger app, Facebook Messenger has now over 500 million monthly active users, growing steadily from the 200 million active users in April. That's a 14th of the entire world's population are on a standalone messaging app created by Facebook. What has happened to the world? Looks like Facebook rivals are getting a little bit jealous this week as Google have released their own standalone messaging app. The app features a familiar Google design and brings new features not available in the stock SMS app, such as the availability to search within the app using OK Google voice command. 
The app also includes support for audio messages, emoticons, coloured text threads, messaging archives and more. But this isn't just an expansion on Google Hangouts. It could be, but for some reason it's not. The app will come pre-installed on all new Android devices running 5.0 Lollipop. So what about us iOS heads then? No news for us. No news for us as of yet. Oh, that's a shame. Twitter have also announced plans to create a new standalone messaging app and it seems their chief executive, Dick Costolo, is keen to put an emphasis on private messaging, stating, I strongly believe private messaging virality is important to our long-term growth. So, Google have essentially created the same product twice here with uh, Google Hangouts and the standalone Google messaging, <laughs> uh, which I really don't get. I, I, all this means is this one's not compatible with SMS and it's not compatible with anybody else using any other messaging app, so... Google Hangouts just didn't sound cool. It was like they were trying too hard to be hip. Yeah. So now they're calling it Google Messaging. Like Google Youth Shelter. Exactly. It's just not cool. It's just not cool. They're, they're trying, um, and unfortunately I think they failed. So maybe they're going for a rebranding and we'll see Google Hangouts disappear like Google Plus seems to be. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not the first time a company's owned the exact same product twice. I mean, WhatsApp, and the Facebook standalone messenger app, the difference between them is about a credit card wide, you know, and uh, <laughs> hopefully that statement will mean a lot more in a couple of weeks uh, because we have a theory that peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions are what they're going for with these messaging apps and they just want to be the first to get in there and set what the commission bar is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the moment, it doesn't really seem to make much sense to develop a standalone app just for messaging. Now, Twitter, and Facebook have announced that apps are designed for a dedicated purpose and Twitter and Facebook are saying that, well, if we have a standalone messaging app, we can, we can create a better user experience for messaging. But we strongly suspect, and so do others who have looked into the code behind the new Facebook Messenger app and the new Twitter messaging app, that peer-to-peer -peer payments is what it's really all about. And we may see soon Twitter and Facebook becoming the next big peer-to-peer -peer payment transfer services. One of the things that really annoys me about having several different versions of messaging apps is that you're not cross-compatible. SMS, say what you like about it, but you can message anybody who has a phone. Whereas with these, they're, they're deliberately making it non-inclusive and taking people away from being able to contact each other, despite the fact it's what they're saying is they're trying to make people contact each other with it better ease. And these aren't even particularly more encrypted than SMS. They're just another place that they can find out more about you for marketing purposes. <laughs> Personally, I think it would be great if somebody released a third party app that ran off of the APIs of Twitter, or Facebook, of all the social networks, so that you could message universally. And I think that would be great. Maybe, maybe there's something out there already that we haven't discovered yet. Or maybe something that Twitter and Facebook don't want us to know about. So we'll do a bit of research into that. Is there an app out there which will allow you to cross-platform message or cross-network message anyone? Like SMS, but as a dedicated app. I'll just stick with SMS. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I really like the way that iMessage is built in with the phone. So even if you're sending an SMS, it will send it automatically as an iMessage. If it's text, it's an iPhone. And that's a really cool thing to have. And uh, they just haven't nailed that on the Android market yet. And I think that third-party applications haven't quite nailed it cross-platform. Speaking about Google and their ventures into messaging, Last week, I was lucky enough to receive an early access invitation to the new Inbox app by Google. I was very excited, I must admit. The app comes with a variety of interesting features, including my personal favourite, Bundles. Now, Bundles intelligently organise mail into several custom and default categories, including updates, social, purchases and travel. It's so convenient and easy. It's incredible, actually, how they're working out what mail is what and categorizing it automatically. It's an absolute pleasure to use. Uh, there's also inbox reminders, which effectively turn inbox into a to-do list with a handy snooze feature to push back reminders to a more convenient time. 
As for the UI, it's important with these kinds of things. Personally, I love the design. I'm a big fan of flat illustrated graphics and liberal white space, both of which Inbox has plenty of. The app also looks and works great on the iPad, which is really important to me as that's my main working tool. For me, they've nailed the careful balancing act between ease of use on the touchscreen and not going beyond the point where the interface starts to look like something out of a children's storybook. There's also the ability to pin emails, which effectively favorites them to a quick view panel by toggling a neat little switch at the top of the screen. Emails that you've snoozed are automatically pinned and show up in the same view, as well as any reminders that you've created, which is pretty handy too. All in all, I've really enjoyed using Inbox and the dumb button, which is an icon showing a big green tick at the top of the screen, has certainly helped me sort through my 200 odd unread emails, which can only be a good thing. I'm quite a big fan of this whole brand image that Google are going for. I think you've nailed it there when you say that sometimes they make it look too much like a children's storybook. Maybe tone that down a little, but eventually I think they'll get there. I don't know, maybe they're hoping that in the future everything's going to be a bit more uh, marshmallows and unicorns. But uh, at the moment, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like a serious platform for business use. It, yeah. seems, it seems like too, too personal use. It's very casual, definitely. Mm. I mean, I do like that about it because a full inbox like mine, I mean, there was there were stages when I've had kind of a oh, thousand... Mr. Popular. Emails. No, honestly, <laughs> with some of the projects we've been working on, I mean, we've been getting a lot of emails and it's kind of intimidating to see when you've got like a thousand emails in your inbox and this dull kind of yeah. plain text screen and Google are mixing up a little bit, which I think is great. And it's kind of becomes kind of a fun game, sweeping away all your old emails. That sounds really sad, but trust me, it's good. It's really good. And we're actually giving away an invite on Twitter right now. So if you head over to our Twitter and message us, we will be giving one lucky listener or one lucky follower an invitation to try out Google Inbox. And also, actually... Did you know? We... <laughs> you caught me off guard though. Our website is now an official member of the Internet Defence League and we have been joining the fight for net neutrality and so has Barack Obama, or so it would seem anyway. In recent weeks, Barack Obama came down unequivocally in favour of net neutrality. To learn more about the history of Obama and net neutrality from a new perspective, make sure you check out the case of net neutrality brackets, foreign affairs, close brackets, what's wrong with Obama's internet policy on audibletrial.com forward slash iOS app to date. They may or may not align with our opinions, but he does put across some interesting points. So last week, Cameron recommended an app to you and it turned out that nobody in the world liked the app at all. So Cameron, do you want to justify what happened there a little bit? Monument Valley we're talking about. <laughs> Firstly, I would like to strongly <laughs> rebut your comment there, <laughs> Because, I mean, let me just explain. Let's, let's put things into perspective because there has been some interesting series of events unfolding this week that I've been following carefully and having to bite my tongue on Twitter, actually. I found myself kind of morphing into a troll at one point and, you know, had to hold in. But yeah, something that really hit me quite hard this week was seeing a photo tweeted by co-founder of Us Two Games, the creators of Monument Valley, and the picture was a series of quite hateful one-star reviews they'd been receiving on iTunes since releasing a paid-for expansion to the game. That's the game Monument Valley that I recommended last week because it is absolutely fantastic. What they, their Twitter later said was... Seems quite a few people have gone back and one star reviewed Monument Valley upon update because the expansion was paid. This makes us sad. And then, that's it. We're giving up the premium game. Next time, we're just going to sell 500 coins for $2 instead. Now this, this deeply deeply shook me to the core and angered me quite a lot. Um, I must say, because iTunes reviews in the US App Store in particular were split roughly 50-50 between people rating the app five stars and other people rating it one star because the expansion wasn't free. And I mean, like, seriously, guys, if we want quality games, we need premium, not freemium. I can't understand why reviewers are continually pushing developers into this unrealistic corner of demanding absolutely everything but not being willing to pay anything. And the sad thing about it is that according to one statistic, 72% of revenue generated on the App Store is through in-app purchases made with freemium games. This is disgusting statistic, Luke. Disgusting. 
I think we've all seen the episode of South Park. Freemium isn't free. I mean, like, come on. It's not a case of you're getting more on freemium apps. You're not getting anything on freemium apps. That's it, exactly. You're yeah. getting a lower quality product for an increased price. In fact, a price that you're continuously charged to progress through the game. Really does disgust me. Monument Valley is an incredible game made by professional artists who need to be paid real salaries to support their families when they go home at night. And this culture of expecting everything for free just isn't acceptable. And I'm making a stand with it today, actually. Despite the controversy, Monument Valley has now surpassed 1.4 million downloads and public attitude seems to have taken a complete U-turn, with posts supporting Monument Valley and its creators surging in a complete tweet storm against the one-star reviewers. And thank God it did, or else I may have given up on humanity entirely. And I'm not being dramatic here, Luke. Seriously. <laughs> you were on the edge, I can I, tell. I, I was on the edge. <laughs> so yeah, basically, if we want to see a change from free to play, we need to make premium apps a sustainable and profitable option for developers. Well, that sad day will unavoidably come when great iOS experiences like Monument Valley and the Sailor's Dream, which I'll be talking more about later, no longer get released. So send your support to us two games on Twitter. That's at us T W O games on Twitter. Tell them they released a great app and that premium is the way forward. And stand against freemium. Forget and, Clash of Clans. And also. <laughs> Forget Clash of Clans and also tag us. We are at iOS App News 24. Now we've been following Uber mm -hmm. since the beginning of time. Since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. from its early days, from its dramatic court cases yep. to its triumph over the EU. Yep. And now today we have some more news. Yeah, mobile ride sharing wave 2.5 has finally arrived. The uh, mobile ride sharing app market has made another push this week with Blah Blah Car, the French company, pushing to go global. Uber testing the waters over in France. India's most popular mobile ride sharing app, Ola, pushing out into more cities. But the one that actually caught my eye and caught my attention this week is Uber allegedly partnering with Spotify. Spotify? Yeah, Spotify. That's interesting. At the moment, informants are remaining anonymous and there's not much I can really say about it, uh, but apparently it's the first of its kind partnership. Now, I have absolutely no idea what a merger between Spotify and Uber would look like, but the speculation online and from these anonymous sources is uh, it may be something along the lines of a person gets into the driver's car, right? Person A is the person who doesn't own a car. Person B is the person in the car. Person A calls the person B, takes a ride with person B. Person A's Spotify account is then streamed and pushed over to person B's car or phone uh, in order to play the music out of their car whilst person A's in their car. But the problem with this lies in the fact that there's things like such as PRS licensing yeah. to go through. I know that Spotify and Uber are absolutely not afraid of legal battles, but they are, it's technically a performance if both of you don't own the same songs. We'll see how it goes legally with that, but it's, it's a very strange partnership. But what else could it be? That's really, really interesting. That's really interesting. I think that's a great idea. And I was going to mention, actually, the PRS license rule, because, I mean, I know how frustrating and how strict they are. Mm, it's yep. a commercial activity, isn't it, Uber? And they will need this kind of licensing. And will we end up with a kind of a, you know, a two-tier or some kind of app spinning yeah. off from Uber and Spotify, like we've seen with Twitter, where it is this kind of this passport to your music that, that walks with you. And I mean, we're getting more smart applications. So it could be that you're, you know, in the future, your phone sinks into all kinds of devices all around you and, and, and kind of plays the music. Yeah, see, they're not very strict on taxis as it is. But if people started doing this, I think it would push them to start being a little bit more strict on business fronts. Uh, they're, they're pretty strict on coaches, as far as I'm aware, and they're very strict on brick and mortar build, yeah, buildings. Yeah, as I found. I don't know. I'm, there's not going to be PRS car chases, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think that it will probably come to a legal issue eventually between Uber themselves and the PRS, not so much the consumer. Yeah. Do you, um, think, do you think Taylor Swift will start firebombing some, some cabs? <laughs> you know... <laughs> yeah. Maybe if you're, if you're using your Spotify in a car with two people in it, you get double the current commission on your Spotify. 
That would be the reasonable be result. Actually, yeah. But that's not what's going to happen. No. <laughs> well, Taylor, if you have any suggestions, you know. You can always hit me up on my private number. <laughs> <laughs> at iOS app news 24, I want in on that. <laughs> Somewhere in the world, there's a very scary looking man named Taylor with a big grin on his face. <laughs> Hello, I'm Taylor from IT. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you want swift fixing, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Uh, a little bit of Xcode banter there for you programmers. <laughs> have another review for you guys this week, another game review. And now, Luke, you've kind of witnessed me playing these peculiar games. I do love your peculiar games. I do love my peculiar games. I've even had studio owner Mark sitting there waiting for this new app to do something. And the app I'm talking about is The Sailor's Dream. Now, The Sailor's Dream is an incredibly poetic and dreamlike interactive story that has you gently uncover the secrets behind a nautical tragedy in a kind of meditative exploration. It's pretty cool. The superb narrative and amazing production values are for me without equal. I haven't come across an app as good as this yet. The game is filled with gorgeous artwork with incredible attention to detail and the music, which is worth the download in its own right, is hauntingly beautiful with a melody that will stay with you long after you close the game. It's kind of like Mario. Yeah, you know, <laughs> no, who remembers the uh, the ocean level of Mario, yeah, with that haunting music. I'm loving this recent surge in games such as The Sailor's Dream and MTN or Mountain, as I discussed last week, that are this kind of complete antithesis to the instant gratification and generation of gamers we're becoming, as a side effect of an increase in mobile and casual gaming. I mean, it's kind of natural that people want to complete a level quickly because they're on the bus or they're on the way to school or they just want to pick up their iPad, play a game for five minutes, put it down and feel like they've achieved something. But it's definitely, it's the same with the internet and YouTube. People's attention span is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And kind of bucking the trend, MTN and The Sailor's Dream, they don't care about that. This, you know, this is a game about patience, game about deep thought. As I've said, it's kind of a, a meditative adventure. And I think the lack of controls in both of these games is something that I find both fascinating and particularly appealing. With patience and the passing of time, both being major themes in these titles. And it, they kind of create a useful pause in our, my life for kind of unexpected introspection. Seriously, I mean, I mean I've mean, i stopped sort of during the day, the working day, just to jump on MTN for like five minutes. And it, it's not an instant gratification thing. It's kind of just a moment to pause and just, you know, chill out. Yeah. Not play these hardcore arcade games that you're tearing your hair out, trying to beat your buddies high score. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it's, it's better than Bejeweled. It's better than Bejeweled, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Bejeweled is the complete other end of the spectrum, I think, to these kinds of things. But yeah, I, don't, I really don't want to reveal too much about the game, uh, but there are two secrets I've discovered that I will reveal, as I noticed a couple of major review sites mistook these elements of the game as inactive features. The first is the transmission horror lodge. So people who are currently playing the game will know exactly what I'm talking about when I describe this place. And my tip is to visit on the hour, every hour, and you won't be disappointed. My second tip is please, please print out the story notes. They will not be what you expect. So let me know what happens. Send me some tweets, some pictures, some whatever of what's happening because it's, it's really quite special. And today, this is really, really cool. You heard this, Luke, actually playing. I collected all of the seven song bottles. I mean, you heard the, the song. And I think not enough recognition has actually gone to the beautiful voice of Stephanie Hedlowski and the amazing voice acting by R. Bruce Elliott. You guys are amazing. We're going to send you a tweet later. And just as some footnotes, we'd like to congratulate last week's guest, Michelangelo Guarice. He's part of the team behind the Fizzly Smart Tag and his Kickstarter campaign has now received over $20,000. Congratulations. If you haven't heard already, this month we're backing the awesome Fizzly Kickstarter campaign. Fizzly is a tiny wearable smart tracker that adds superpowers to your iPhone and iPad by allowing them to sense what's happening in the real world. You can learn more about it on their Kickstarter page by visiting www.kickstarter.com forward slash Fizzly tag. And we've got a fizzily being sent to the studio as soon as they're being shipped. So we're going to be experimenting with that and bringing you the news as have it we comes. Really? We have. We have got I a fizzly. I didn't know that. I was like, oh, I'm so excited. We've got a fizzily coming, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually so excited. The Philips Hue and pretty much every single smart device 
in the studio is just going to be going crazy. We're going to be hooking up to all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be great. Uh, and speaking of smart technology, we've also been in talks with the Internet of Things People's Choice Award winner 2014, Shortcut Labs, who we should be having on the show very shortly. They're launching their award-winning new home and mobile shortcut device, Flick, which you can hear more about in next week's podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter uh, and be in for the chance of winning premium apps every week. Visit our website, www.apptodatepodcast.3deal.co.uk. That's apptodatepodcast.3, the number three, deal.co.uk. I'll be selecting one of the subscribers to send them the sailor's dream this week. And in next week's show, we'll be telling you more about our secret project with the Bitcoin Society and the Fever Bitcoin Wallet where you can get some free downloads and some free bitcoins. So subscribe for that. Thank you so much to all of our listeners. If you think this show has been worth a buck or a quid and you would like to help us on our podcast Pipe Dreams, please donate to our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash app news. For links to our Twitter, Instagram, PayPal, Fever Bitcoin Wallet, all of the apps discussed in the show and much, much, much more, visit our website, apptodatepodcast.3deal.co. UK. Oh, can I just say one more thing? No. And something that's intriguing is that our boss actually shook hands with Obama. He did. He actually shook hands with Obama while... Obama. On a top secret mission. Well, I was in, was in Baghdad in, 20, in January 28. Might be 2009. Yeah. Maybe 2009? Yeah. <laughs> he shook hands with Obama in Baghdad in an unconfirmed year. <laughs> 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 <laughs>